there's a lot of scepticism still about EVs out there. So let's deal with some of the, the urban myths. As someone who drives one every day, they are great for urban use. I still struggle to do long distances. It's about choosing the right EV or hybrid for your needs, isn't it? When you're looking at um, the right vehicle for you now, that starting point is changing. That starting point is turning to what are my actual transport needs and therefore what technology will meet those needs best. If you're a high mileage motorway driver doing 30,000 miles a year as, as, as a business driver, an electric vehicle with a 150 mile range probably isn't going to be suitable for you. And neither would be a plug-in hybrid that could do, let's say, 20 miles in electric mode, then switches over to, to petrol. But when you start moving into the more urban-centric driving, then pure electrics uh, are an excellent choice because the fuel costs are greatly reduced. On a pure electric, we're finding maintenance is some 30% yep. or more lower than an equivalent diesel vehicle, for instance. I think my last service on a Leaf was 100 quid and I haven't put tyres or brake pads on it or anything. So, Carl, tell me how many battery <laughs> failures you, you've had. And it was, was it 12? Uh, no, it was less than that, and it wasn't battery failures because you're also including the uh, accident damaged vehicles in there. So the reliability of the, of the vehicles is is immense, and the batteries, particularly, they're lasting so much longer. And we've seen lots of Nissan Leafs on taxi companies with 175,000 miles on them, and they're still not 90% charged. Because we obviously deal with a lot of taxi companies. Uh, they, they like EVs when they take them on. And we've got, I can think of one example where they have a, a medium-sized saloons and they also have Leafs. So in the three and a half, four years that they've operated the Leafs, their drivers, the same drivers, if they're in the, in the other car, can go through a set of pads in three to four months. Um, they've still got Leafs, some of their early ones, which still haven't had a brake pad uh, change. I know. So they're very, very good. And this is because um, of regenerative braking, isn't it? Yes. And it, it, it helps create more electricity, slows the car down without needing to touch the, touch the brake, which is great. Let's talk very quickly about chargers, because it's not ideal out there. We've got lots of um, uh, three kilowatt legacy chargers that take a long time to charge these cars up. We don't have enough motorway chargers. And really, we need more 50 kilowatt and even 100 kilowatt chargers. Mm -hmm. um, if you had to say to government, what, what do we need as a charging infrastructure? What would, what would that look like, Jay? We're still way behind where we need to be from a registration point of view. Mm -hmm. Only half a percent of all vehicles being sold are electric vehicles. The Committee for Climate Change are saying by 20, 2030, yeah. It's going to be 60% EV penetration. penetration. I think the big challenge is that leap of faith. You know, it's an unknown, unknown technology to most businesses and individuals. What we're trying to do is encourage government to stimulate that demand. Yes, EVs are a different way of driving. You need to think about charging them. You need to be planning ahead. There is an inconvenience, an impractical point of view. However, that could be easily offset by the cost savings that you could achieve. Planning, better planning and better consideration. But also I think what the government, what we're calling on the government to do is to give more in-life incentives. So it's things like making a difference. So if you're sitting in a, a busy, uh, congested street, you should be able to use the bus lanes. With As spine. Norway does. As Norway does. With great success. And you should give a bit more tax certainty. So we were simply saying for the next 10 years, give those vehicles a tax break, a very clear tax break. So that's not in the first hand market, but in the second hand market, it actually passes through. They shouldn't so have VAT on them. Should, mm. Absolutely. And there are you know, things like free parking. So there are, as you, as you rightly point out, there are good global examples of where the best selling car is an electric vehicle. And yet you look at the UK, one of the worst selling cars is an EV. So that needs to change if we're gonna meet those targets. And we could suddenly, um, with good stimulate, good sensible tax policies, we believe that can change. You drive an EV every day, Carl. How often do you have to charge? You do quite a long commute, don't you? If I'm going to the, the office, which is a 120 mile round trip in my car, uh, I will be charging it once a day. However, if I've got shorter uh, journeys, which I quite often do, I will then be charging every few days. You tend to find that when you start with an EV, you, you do try and maximise the charge. So you, if you come home and it's got 70%, you charge it. But in time, when you get used to it, you do it less and less. So if I know I'm going to use 40% the next day and I've got 50, 60 60% in the battery, I won't bother charging it. I'll only really charge it when I need to. And that's good husbandry, actually, in terms of batteries, isn't it? You should only charge it when it gets to a certain level, less than 30, I think. 
Yes, yeah. It, it does. It does seem to, to have a, an impact there. The, the, the ideal for a battery for longevity isn't to take it from 100% 90 charge, 100% 70 charge. It's, it's to actually use it. So you're better off getting it down to a level and then, and then recharging it. The battery technology is progressing really well. So we are getting batteries that are the same size but are now a higher energy density and giving better ranges. At the end of the day, the UK is a fairly small place and we're now getting plug-in vehicles, uh, pure electrics, that can, can do 150 to 250 miles on a single charge, which does actually mean most people will be able to just charge the vehicle from home overnight and do the vast majority of their driving on one charge. But we're really now, I think, in that zone where the ranges have moved from sort of just under 100 miles per charge to, to the 150 to 250, which we're finding for the average business user um, is, okay. is, is, is plenty. Battery's only part of it is actually the efficiency of the engine as well. So the new one's up 38% in power, so it's even more fast, which is even more fun. But the vehicle itself is getting more miles per kilowatt hour battery than the other one was. And I think that's kind of the benefit of having 300,000 of them running around. You can work out how to optimize how the vehicle works. Your 40 kilowatt Zoe is great, but it doesn't have a fast charge facility, does it? It doesn't. Um, the fastest it will charge is at 22 kilowatt. So 40 kilowatt battery, 22 kilowatts is just under two hours. That's not very helpful at a motorway service station. That's not a cup of coffee. So that's, so that's, that's a real challenge, I yeah. think, on that vehicle. And that's and, and why you've got to do your research and absolutely. know what your needs are. And if you've got that time in your life yeah. to be able to do two hours at a service station, yeah. Some thoughts on residuals from everybody. I've, I've got to defer to Chris here since he's got the most electric cars of everybody around this table. Um, what are they like? Because this was one of the myths, wasn't it? You, you buy one, you lose a lot of money. I certainly did in the first yep. days of, of ownership of, of the Mitsubishis. What are they like now? At the end of the day, residual values are a funny thing and they will vary from manufacturer and from model and how many are being sold in the marketplace. There's always going to be um, an initial challenge in the second-hand market because fleet operators tend to be more informed about new technologies than the general public. This is an interesting point. Um, and when are we going to get to that stage? Because we've had lots of early adopters, lots of evangelists who have, who have bought these cars, and they would have bought them at any cost and put up with all sorts of difficulties, as, as we around this table have. But when do you think we'll get to the stage where what we, we would call mainstream consumers, mainstream businesses, will buy EVs, pure EVs, really without thinking? I think, I think we're there, and to take your residual value point, if you look at, I think, Jay's point that the new car market basically manufactures the used, cars, used car market a few years down the line, and I can, I can give you some examples of that, because we as a manufacturer had, if you look at the uptake of EVs, um, and because a lot of them are on three-year cycles, last year we had the, we went from, sorry, the year before, 400 vehicles coming back into the dealer network. Last year it was just shy of 3,000 used vehicles. It only become mainstream if the first-hand market is buying those and feeding the second-hand market. Yeah. Otherwise, I think it's a bit of chicken and egg. You won't get the big mass adoption over, overnight. Yeah. So, that, but how far, Jay, are we away from that moment? I think we're still far away. I mean, if you look at the um, total number of registrations of pure it's EVs, 5%. It's, it's, well, that's no, less, actually, it's, that's it's all ha electric, exactly, yeah. it's half a percent. Half a percent of it's nowhere near where yeah. we need to be. So I think this is a wake-up call for the government that this, you've got fantastic products being produced, they're readily available, and it's the government need, need to stimulate that demand, um, both in the first and in the second air market. We've Tell us, Keith, about you know, lamppost charging. Well, there's a whole range of different options being put forward for those one-third of the population that don't have a driveway. Mm. So if you want to, if you own a car, and you don't have a driveway, it's very difficult to move to electric. So London and other places are trying lamppost charging. And they're also kind of general, they can, can't be fast charging, they can only be so three kilowatts? Three, well, three, three to seven kilowatts. Three, yeah. So again, if you've got a big battery, that's quite a long time. So what we're finding is supermarkets thinking quite creatively about how to win more footfall by providing charging infrastructure in their car parks and how potentially to link that to their loyalty cards to reward their customers with a cheaper cost of charging. The other area is obviously moving towards more this so-called mobility as a service. So I rent the car when I want mm. it. If I live in a big city, I don't need to own a car. I might want a car, but I'll rent it for an hour, a half a day, a day or a weekend, and I'll choose the appropriate vehicle for the journey I'm going to do.
And that's playing quite nicely into the sector. You almost got that net Netflix culture merging into the yeah. motoring world mm -hmm. where people are moving away from ownership to usership. Mm -hmm. And that sort of dynamics where actually you don't need to think about just having one car for, for the entire 365 mm -hmm. days of the year. You can have a mixture of different vehicles for your needs. Let's finish by getting everybody's view of how they want to see the world of electric cars and hybrids um, in the next five years. Jay, what, what's your kind of vision? I think the adoption is, is going to naturally happen. However, I think government now need to start thinking about what that five-year horizon needs to look like. That. And I think that's where we're trying to have a, a constructive conversation with government, potentially even conversations around road pricing. What about you? Well, I think in the next five to ten years, all new vehicles operating in cities, cars and vans will be 100% electric. I don't think they'll be hybrid. I also think that collaboration with energy companies, I think that's going to be really interesting, how your electric vehicle with a battery in it provides support to the grid, which is earning you some income, but also helping balance the system, allowing more photovoltaics, more renewable generation in cities, and that interaction I think will be really exciting. I would like to see ranges of up to 300 miles for mainstream 25 grand cars, charging much more prevalent um, and also charging that you can achieve in maybe 10 minutes, not an hour. What about you? I, I, I totally agree with that. I think we're nearly there on range. The infrastructure, there are some really good signs on the horizon, um, some ultra high speed chargers at 350 kilowatt. And Carl, as the uh, maker of the most electric cars in the world, I kind of know what your ambitions are. <laughs> but. In the next five years, without giving us any secrets, <laughs> what do you think that, that landscape is going to look like? Is there going to be a huge amount of change? I think it will. I've been in the industry 29 years now, and I think we've been through periods of slow evolution for, for decades. At the moment, we are going through quite a vast revolution, really. In the last 100 years, this is the Absolutely. biggest change in the landscape ever. Absolutely. I wasn't there for the first 70 years of it. But <laughs> was, in the last 29 years, I, I agree. And I, I can only just mirror what uh, my colleagues here have said. It's all about us all working together. So all the different factors, all the different uh, players working together to make sure that it's quite painless and it's uptake. It's a development of the technology. For me, the big evolutionary step is the move into digital connected vehicles. The electric vehicle will take that step into something else. So the form it'll take in five years time isn't petrol or diesel versus electric. It's uh, basically, it's a, it's a new use, and I think for me that's the, the big change. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your insights and contributions. Thank you, and here's to a greener, cleaner future.